questions? Okay, we're a go. Are you ready for this? Yeah. <laughs> so we had our introduction. We had your introduction to the pelvis in the ischial anal fossa, right? That was fun. And uh, some of you even started to move into the urogenital part of the perineum and realize the complexity of that area, right? Yeah. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about mainly today, is we're going to talk about the urogenital aspect of the perineum and, and remind you a little bit about the uh, anal triangle as well. Um, so here are your learning objectives uh, with your links, which are your learning expectations. So uh, the perineum. Before we begin on the nitty-gritty details of the anatomy, I just want to bring up uh, an important part of, of this topic is, is that the perineum is sensitive. I mean, not anatomically, yes, but I mean, it's, it's a sensitive topic to discuss. Okay. I'm not going to assume anyone knows any particular information. Okay? We're going to start at the beginning, as just like we did with the arm or the back, we did in the thorax. So I'm going to tell you what a penis is, we're going to talk about a vagina, we're going to talk about sensitive topics that usually we don't talk about in casual conversation and polite conversation with other people. Uh, but we're, you all are going to be physicians, and your patients are going to come into clinic to see you, and they're going to hope you have answers for them, that they might not want to ask those questions to other people. And so it is still a topic that is... Um, should be respected uh, educationally and really given the same respect as all the other areas of the body, okay? And so don't be, um, well, we all are a little squeamish when it comes to talking about this uh, area just because of the sensitivity of it, but don't be embarrassed to ask questions. I've had lots of questions. You'd be I've had lots of different types of questions, and it's okay. This is the time you wanna do that to make sure that your understanding of the anatomy of this area is just as deep as the other areas, okay? All right, so this was just my reminder slide here to talk to you about that. So, where is the perineum? Now, we, I, this was the very end of my last lecture. Um, the perineum is that area that's between the thighs, between the buttocks, and it's shallower than the pelvic cavity, so it's more towards the outside. In an anatomic position, it's going to be inferior. Okay. And uh, it has a couple different regions, one of them being the ischial anal fossa, and the other one is the urogenital. All right, so this is uh, what the perineum looks like when we have the legs abducted, and you can see uh, the female urogenital region here. The anal regions look dissimilar in both sexes, and this is the male urogenital region up here, which we'll be discussing mainly today. And I'll just remind you of the uh, bony landmarks underneath, and it really will serve you well if you always bring yourself back to those bone landmarks uh, when studying this anatomy from here on out. And so make sure that you get very comfortable with this view and from the osseous um, uh, factors. Not, not, you're going you're to be making a dissection similar to this, although all of the nerve vasculature has been removed here. So. Uh, it's not going to be quite just looking at muscles of the pelvic floor and of the um, urogenital region, but be comfortable with the bones, although you're not going to see them ever when, during the dissection in lab. Okay, I need to talk to you about a couple new players here that are um, the kind of named in a, in a general sense, so they, they don't really stick out in your mind. The, the perineal membrane, oh great, another fascia layer, another membrane, right, that I need to learn. But this is a special player, this is a, a main player that is different from other fascia that we've talked about. So the perineal membrane, which I'm, I continue to make this more of a study guide for you, uh, less of a presentation. The perineal membrane is going to be a deep fascia layer that is contained in the urogenital aspect of the perineum in both the male and the female. Okay, it's highlighted here in yellow. And so you're going to use this perineal membrane as an orient, uh, orienting structure to separate out 
contents that are more superficial and contents that are deeper, and we'll talk about different um, spaces and their names, and you'll know what to expect in these spaces. So this perineal membrane is the deep fascia of this region that is going to be an important main player uh, throughout this topic here. All right, now another main player is a structure called the perineal body. The perineal body is a fibromuscular um, point that sort of is a joining area where things from the urogenital region are coming and coming posteriorly and, and attaching to this fibromuscular structure. And then also you have muscle layers and uh, connective tissue layers that are coming from the posterior aspect and moving anteriorly and are all going to meet at this structure called the perineal body. It, it is uh, kind of irregular, so you might, you know, all the perineal bodies are, are not necessarily going to be uh, similarly similar in their structure when you get there and you look at them, but it's sort of like a, a little hard mass. You can palpate it and feel it better. It's a hard mass that looks like muscle, but it also looks like a, you know, fascia, um, and so it might not be um, visually uh, striking when you're dissecting, but you do want to find this structure, and I'm going to bring it up m uh, multiple times because a lot of the muscles of the perineum uh, are going to attach to this perineal body, some of which are mentioned here. So, and a lot of the uh, musculature that attaches to this perineal body are superficial, but, and you can see those depicted in this illustration, but some of the muscle is going to be deep, like slips of muscle from the external urethral sphincter, which is not shown here because it's deep, it's below these layers, from the levator ani that we talked about in last lecture, and parts from the, of the rectum. Those are going to also attach to the perineal body. So this gives support to pelvic, the pelvic floor, pelvic viscera, and structures that are in the perineum. So it is an important player that you're going to want to not just sort of bypass perineal body and perineal membrane, although the names are kind of general terms. Okay. So we uh, already, you already have been introduced to the anal triangle and uh, the contents of the anal triangle, and we kind of made our way through those dissections on Monday. All right. But we didn't really get a chance to talk about the anal canal. So you did uh, dissect out the exterior of the anal canal, um, but what we're going to do, uh, not today, but Friday, is to split the pelvis and you'll be able to see the inside of the anal canal um, as well. So the anal canal is the terminal portion of the GI tract and it is going to begin where the ampulla of the rectum ends and after it passes through the pelvic floor. So after the rectum passes through the pelvic floor, through that puborectalis sling that we talked about on Monday, it is going to be transformed into the anal canal. So it's a specialized uh, portion. And uh, here you can see it highlighted in yellow. Now usually the gut, although they, they make the gut uh, and the rectum all in the anal canal, sometimes they open it up in an illustration uh, like this so that you can look at the anatomy. In life, the anal canal is constricted. Um, normally, okay, because of the muscular wall. All right, and so it's going to um, have the, that perineal body that we just talked about is going to be just anterior to the anal canal, because part of the musculature attaches there, and then posterior is going to be that anococcygeal ligament that we talked about last lab, last lecture. And there are two important muscular sphincters that help, um, that, or, or that, play a role with constricting the anal canal, and one is called the internal anal sphincter, and it is a continuation of the circular uh, smooth muscle coat in the wall of the gut, and so it's autonomically innervated, so it's involuntary. It's autonomically innervated, so it has smooth muscle, it's the internal coat um, of the wall of the anal canal. Okay. And Dr. Campo is going to talk to you about the autonomics of the pelvis and also innervation because she's going to talk also about the sacral plexus and give you a little bit more uh, heads up on the interplay, although I did keep notes for you in the lecture just so it could be a good study guide for you. 
And then there is an external anal sphincter, and the external anal sphincter is made of skeletal muscle, and it is voluntary. So you can contract your external anal sphincter to keep contents from coming out of your anal canal, feces or gas, flatulence, whichever um, ends up being there. And then I don't know if you did end up dissecting accidentally or what we do when you, when you split the anal canal, as you can see how the uh, a pelvic diaphragm, essentially pubic rectalis, comes down and a, mus a muscle slip will separate the internal and external anal sphincters. And, and you can actually see the separation. So if you get a bad cut, you can just sort of take a scalpel and, and cut it cleanly, and then you'll be able to hopefully demarcate the difference between the internal and external anal sphincters. Their innervation being the main um, difference between these two. Now, there are also a couple other anatomic points of the anal canal where the rectum narrows down and goes through the pelvic floor after it comes on the other side, we're in the anal canal, and there are longitudinal ridges called anal columns uh, that are demarcated here, and the superior rectal arteries and veins are what are, is behind these anal columns and makes those elevations in the walls. So we have the superior rectals coming down. I know it's rectal, also uh, the anal canal is um, the target for the arteries that are named rectus, unfortunately. But um, here you can see these ridges, and you can see them in the cadaver if you have a good, a good specimen, so these longitudinal ridges. At the bottom of the ridges, there are valves that are called anal valves okay, that you can find, and it looks kind of like a little V-shaped cup, almost like a cusp of a, the aortic valve or the uh, pulmonary semilunar valve. Okay. And, uh, whoops, just above those valves, there are depressions called anal sinuses. And when fecal matter pushes against these anal valves and sinuses, the mucosa um, lining, the epithelial cells in the mucosa, will exude mucus to help with the passage of the feces. Okay, so these are just, you know, good anatomic uh, points here for passing feces without irritating the lining of the anal canal. The pectinate line is just inferior to the valves, and that's going to be the transition between the endodermally de derived and superior aspect of the rectum and the inferior aspect of the rectum, which was ectodermally derived, and that was uh, discussed in the development lecture for the gut. And um, here is the anatomic point here. So you're going to have transition between vasculature, which, which vessels supply the walls, you're going to have um, transition and innervation as well at this line. So don't forget to review that material and lymphatic drainage as well. And your book goes, and, and you already had a lecture on lymphatic drainage. Okay, so the male urogenital triangle. The male urogenital triangle is going to have the penis and the scrotum. Um, the testes were talked about with the abdomen, and it's, so it's not even in the pelvis chapter. Um, it's in the abdomen chapter of your textbook. Um, and there are also several special muscles of the perineum uh, that are involved, that are located in the male urogenital triangle. All right. So when, I, uh, when we do internal organs, we'll do the deeper parts of the urethra that are inside the pelvis. So the first part of the male urethra that is contained in the perineum is, is not the first part of the urethra. It actually is the part called the membranous or the intermediate part, which goes through the pelvic floor. Okay? Uh, depending on whether or not you, uh, your textbook has four parts of the male urethra because it has a pre-prostatic part, which isn't always there depending on the fullness of the bladder. Uh, a lot of textbooks say there are three parts of the male urethra, a prostatic, the membranous, and spongy. Um, and so that's why the terminology is slightly different if you're reading the text. So we're going to start here with the intermediate or membranous part, which is the part of the male urethra that passes through the pelvic floor. Uh, and it begins in, just inferior to the prostate gland. And you'll be able to see this part. It's a very short part of the urethra. When we do the uh, section, we section the pelvis, and you can look from a mid-sagittal view, and you'll be able to see the short little part that goes through the, the floor. Okay? And it's going to uh, penetrate the perineal membrane that we talked about. That will become a main player later. Then the rest of the uh, urethra externally is called the spongy or penile urethra. And that's going to go the whole course of the penis, whether or not it's the attached deep part of the penis or whether or not it's the pendulous part of the penis. It's called the spongy or penile and goes all the way to the external urethral orifice at the very end. 
Um, and then there's a slight swelling at the end, just um, proximal to the orifice called the navicular fossa, which is um, a little uh, dilated portion, which you'll see probably in lab. Okay, so the, the turning point's not working this morning, but we can still answer the question, which part of the male urethra can be damaged or would most likely be damaged when inserting a urethral sound because it's the narrowest and least distensible? So of these parts here, which one do you think would be the narrowest and the least dispensable, distensible part? This is from one of your clinical boxes in the text. Um, the prostatic, okay, anybody have any others? The intermediate? All right, yeah, those are all good choices because uh, they're parts of the urethra. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a clinician. I, I take a, a step outside of my, my comfort zone. When I, but I, saw, I find them really interesting. Uh, and so what they were, they were talking about in this clinical box is that of, of the parts of the urethra, they were talking, the intermediate part is supposed to be the narrowest, but the external urethra orifice itself is the least dispensable. It's very fibrous when you're putting in the urethral sound. That, so if you have put, you're putting in this tool into the male urethra and it passes through that orifice, then it's probably going to be, you know, unless there's an abnormal constriction, that it should be able to pass through the rest of the urethra. I don't know. I've never done it before, but it sounded really cool to me. Okay. And um, you all did pretty good. <laughs> There you go. All right. So the male has uh, some glands that are associated with the male reproductive tract. And uh, one of them is called the bulbal urethral gland. It's, uh, they're, they're small glands that sit alongside the membranous part or intermediate part of the male urethra. Okay. Their openings or their ducts pass th through or, or distal to that and actually enter the proximal part of the spongy urethra. So you're not going to see the openings. They're very small. You may not see them at all. I think I've only seen three in all the male cadavers that I've helped dissect. So uh, you might not see them, but they, they do exist. And the bulbal urethral glands are important because they release secretion upon excitation and uh, the secretions help to um, balance the pH in the urethra before the semen comes through. So it's usually uh, pre-ejaculation uh, fluid that is going to come through the male urethra. Okay. There are also a lot of small glands in the wall of the urethra, so just not in the mucosa, but just below the mucosa or deep to it. And those glands are called, collectively called paraurethral glands. So when you're looking at the microscopy of the male urethra, you'll see a whole bunch of glands underneath the mucosa, and they just empty, have lots of small openings that empty the whole course of the urethra to release secretions just to help with passage and to help protect the mucosal lining. Okay. The scrotum, which you have uh, dissected part of it uh, previously when we did the, the inguinal canal and, and down into the scrotum and the um, spermatic cord, it is a fibromuscular sac. Hopefully, uh, uh, you might have looked at a couple slips of the dartos muscle in the, in the scrotum. Um, and it is, uh, you, pro you may have noticed that it's situated posterior inferiorly to the actual penis. Now, the cadavers have an artifactual swelling that occurs in the genital region uh, for the male and the female. So some of you may have uh, vulva that are very swollen, and it might even be difficult to discern between the female uh, different uh, majora, labia majora and minora. And some of you may have huge scrotum, and you may have a huge scrotum, you may be wondering, is, is this the way that this person um, was in life? And that's probably not the case. There, there is a lot of swelling that occurs in this area um, that is artifactual from the embalming process. Okay. And so um, there 
and, when, and you might have noticed, I don't know if you, you've come down into this area yet, but when you do dissect the scrotum and you go through the steps in the dissector, you'll notice that the scrotum is separated by a septum. So there's one testis on each side typically. And the seam that, uh, and we'll talk about this, we do development, why that happens. The seam, midline seam, is going to be continuous on the ventral aspect of the penis and in the perineal region all the way to the anus. And so you, you'll notice that. I'm going to go into the development of it when we do that next week. Uh, but anyways, it is an anatomic uh, point that you'll be finding when you go through the dissector instructions. Okay, so the penis is the male organ for sexual intercourse, but it also has the urethra inside. And so for the male, their um, uh, erectile tissue contains the urethra. And for the female, uh, there, there is no urethra coming through the erectile tissue. And so we have a separation in the rectal tissue in this organ into different cavities. So that's unique. So there are uh, three different erectile cavities in the penis, two corpora cavernosa and one corpus spongiosum. And if you, uh, the spongiosum has the urethra in it. And if you're trying to remember, I always think, you know, you would clean urine off the floor with a sponge. So it kind of helps you remember which one, which one is which. All right, and this is what the penis looks like when it's been dissected. And you can see the corpora cavernosa um, are going to be dorsally, and they are going to attach to the issue of pubic rami. And then the corpora spongiosum is going to be ventrally and extends all the way to the end of the penis, which is called the glands. So there are different parts. There is a root, which is going to be the attached part of the penis, not the part that you see, the pendulous part, but the part that's attached in the perineal region that you'll be dissecting uh, when you do the perineal region and take off the skin. There is a pendulous part that's called the body, and that is the part that is free or not attached under the skin. And then there is the glands or head of the penis at the very end, which urine is going to come out the very end to help you think that it's the corpus spongiosum that goes all the way to the end of the penis and not the cavernosum. Okay. This is the penis in anatomic position. In anatomic position, the penis is erect, and the dorsal side is this side here that is going to be closer to the abdomen, and the ventral side is this side here. Okay. All right. We're going to do fascia uh, later on, too, but I just want to point out that there are specialized fascia layers that are in the penis that have special names. One is the Buck's fascia, which is a deep fascia, fascial layer. Uh, and so we're going to do fascias later and go down from superficial to deep, but this is, will give us sort of a new uh, understanding of deep fascia in the perineal region that is different from the fascial layers that you were studying in the abdomen. It's not going to be continuous with that. Okay? But this fascia is really important because it binds, as you saw on the last slide, not that slide, but this slide, you can see how the parts of the penis, they're not necessarily um, attached to each other. They have a tunica albuginea, which is a connective tissue covering on each of the, the uh, cavernous sinuses, I mean cavernous sinuses, um, the cavernous, cavernous tissue, the erectile tissue, but they are bound together by the deep fascia of the penis to be one unit. Okay, and that's what you're looking at here. All right, um, and so, I wanted to show, and this, this just reminds you of what it looks like um, from this kind of view, but I want to also show you a cross section. So what you can see here are the two corpora cavernosum that are separate cavities, but they are incompletely separated. There is a septum penis in the center that allows for communication from one cavern, it's, um, the cavity to the other. And then here you can see the corpus spongiosum here with the spongy urethra coming down the middle. There are also arteries and nerves, there are veins, and there's connective tissue layers in the penis. Uh, and you'll be dissect painfully dissecting out a lot of these small structures in lab today, uh, irregardless of whether you have the male or the female. Okay, so here you can see the root of the penis. It, is, consists, it consists of crora that attach to the issue of pubic rami. There's two of them, one on each side. These crora have the corpus cavernosum, and they are going to come together distally in the pendulous part. And then in the center, there is a structure that's called the bulb of the penis, and the bulb of the penis is going to contain the corpus spongiosum. 
Okay. And so it's going to be just distal to the prostate gland and the pelvis. And so now we're coming all the way down and coming up to the floor of the pelvic diaphragm and passing through the urogenital hiatus. Okay. So here you can see another view of the detached penis here where the intermediate part or membranous part of the urethra is coming through the floor of the pelvis. That's where the bulb of the penis starts and it's going to uh, course anteriorly. So this is the attached. You can see the crura on, ghosted on the sides, the bulb in the center, and then they come together and this is the body or the pendulous part of the penis. Okay. So the crura in the bulb of the penis have special muscles that are on top, very, very um, thin, superficial muscles on top of the bulb and the crura. But the actual body of the penis itself, except for a few extensions of the slips, don't ha doesn't have any muscle in it. Okay, this is not made of muscle. And then you can see the glands of the penis here is the distal portion, the corpus spongiosum continues and makes and has the glands, which is going to have the external urethral orifice. Okay? And it's highly innervated just as like in the penis as it is in the clitoris too. And some of you may have an uncircumcised penis, and some of you have a uh, circumcised, there's, you know, there's usually a mixture in the laboratory, and so just, just trying to give you a, um, a heads up here, the uncircumcised penis is going to have four skin that is attached, it's this double skin layer that's attached here uh, to the glands, and that's why it's folded over and usually extends to different ex uh, variable amounts over the glands of the penis. And so this one is, is circumcised, the foreskin has been removed, and this one has not been circumcised, and this is a, a figure that is showing you what it looks like there. And there is a frenulum, it's not pictured here because it's on the ventral side, that attaches the skin to the glands and uh, the corona of the glands. All right, there are a couple ligaments that support the penis. Your textbook talks about them, um, and you, may, you do see them listed in the dissector images. Uh, one that's sort of more well-known is called the suspensory ligament, and the suspensory ligament is attached to the anterior part of the pubic synthesis, as is the other one, but this one is a totter ligament that um, is going to come down and it's going to attach to the deep penile fascia of the penis. And in some situations, um, men choose to cut this ligament to extend the length of the penis. So that is a cosmetic uh, surgery that is done occasionally. And then another ligament called the fundiform ligament is kind of more of a looser uh, ligament that isn't uh, attached to the deep penile fascia and it sort of uh, goes all the way around the penis and, and it really doesn't have the same kind of supportive function. It sort of just adds a, a little bit of support to the penis. Okay. And the main point is that it's an extension of the cutane, uh, subcutaneous fascia or the superficial fascia of the perineum down here, the, the same layer that is scarpus fascia up here in the abdomen, but in the perineum is more superficial fascia. Okay, and so the names of the specialized muscles that lie over the crura and the bulb of the penis are called the ischiocavernosa. Ischiocavernosus muscles are over the crura. There's, there's one on each side. And there are also two bulbospongiosus muscles that meet in the middle over the bulb of the penis. And then another muscle that is also in this uh, part of the perineum is called the superficial transverse perineal muscle that is going to come here at the junction of the bulbospongiosus and the perineal body here. So that's when you're looking at... Um, that in lab. You can find all of these muscles, probably most of you will find uh, these muscles uh, in your dissections today. Yes? Those are the borders of the perineal membrane? Yeah, I'm going to talk. I'll, I'll, yeah, you're, you're good. I like the way you're going there. All right, we'll get to that. Okay. If I don't make it clear, ask me that one more time, okay? okay. All right. Now, the female urogenital triangle, there are some, going to be some players that are similar than, to the male urogenital triangle, but we definitely have a different setup here. So we, they include the mons pubis, which is, um, uh, we'll talk about that on the next slide, the labia majora, labia minora, uh, the clitoris, which uh, you can see uh, better here in this illustration, and we have bulbs of the vagina, 
uh, and we have some specialized glands as well that are included in this area for the female. The mons pumis is going to be this area that is anterior to the pubic symphysis that you have already dissected because the round ligament of the uterus, ter uterus terminates in the mons pubis and, and extends down into the labia majora. Um, and it was filled with fat. And so there are uh, usually coarse hair on top of the mons pubis, but it has a lot of fat underneath. And so if you can sort of keep in your mind's eye that the pubic symphysis is, is just below this area. Okay. And it's continuous with the anterior abdominal, the fat that's in that area is continuous with the anterior abdominal wall, which also comes down into the labia majora, which is on the outside of the pusendal cleft. So here you can see uh, the labia majora here with the legs abducted, and there are two commissures, an anterior and posterior commissure, uh, and they are fat filled, they are covered with hair, and they're more external than the labia minora, which is the next folds of skin. The labia minora are usually smooth, they usually don't have hair on them, and they're usually shiny because they do exude uh, some secretions. It looks like a mucous membrane, but it's not, it's still thin skin. Um, and, but there are different kinds of glands in the dermis of the skin. And there are two um, folds that meet anteriorly, uh, I think I have it on the, on the next slide, of the menorah, but they are going to actually line the vestibule of the vagina. And so the labia minora are going to be the innermost folds of skin that are going to line the vestibule, which has the vagina, and it has the external urethral orifice in it for the female. There isn't any fat, there isn't a considerable amount of fat in the labia minora like there is in the majora, and there isn't a rectal tissue filling the labia minora, although the proximal parts of the labia minora has a little bit of the uh, bulb, which is made of erectile tissue. But the menorah themselves are just thin folds of skin, okay? And has a little bit of uh, connective tissue inside. Lots of blood vessels. Okay, the clitoris uh, is, is uh, the female sexual organ, and it's highly innervated, just like the penis is. It uh, has two crora that are going to attach, really, I mean, the issue of pubic ramus, the, the crora of the penis attached started attachment down here, so it's going to be more superior to that, so mainly the inferior pubic rami is going to attach to the bone and the perineal membrane. It is, they're both going to meet in the middle to make the body of the clitoris, which extends anteriorly, inferiorly to the glands. So it, it's kind of similar in structure to the penis, although uh, we don't have the urethra coming through the clitoris like we do in the penis, and so we don't have that third uh, erectile a body joining the cavernosum here. But there is a bulb of the vestibule which is, is made of erectile tissue and that is going to be lateral to the um, uh, vestibule of the vagina and, and the urethral opening. Okay. Oh, and I did want to point that for uh, female sexual function, the clitoris can enlarge when it fills with blood, just like the penis enlarges during erection as well. So I, I searched a lot for a, a picture that really did uh, the prep use and the frenulum justice. The labia minora kind of ends anteriorly in these two different, they're close to each other, but they're two folds. And so the glands uh, of the clitoris is going to be underneath this prepuce, which is the hood, which extends on top of this fold of the labia minora meeting here, which is called the frenulum. And so you may see these in the cadaver, but with the swelling, the artifactual swelling with the embalming process, it might be distorted. So it might be kind of hard to see these anatomic points, but this is the way it looks uh, in, real, in real life, uh, typical of real life. Okay. And so the vestibule of the vagina, uh, which I alluded to, and I forgot that I had this special slide here, is going to be between the labia minora. It's going to house the opening orifice for the vagina and the external urethral or orifice, as well as openings to special glands, the greater vestibular glands and the lesser vestibular glands and the periurethral glands. There's the external orifice. We'll talk about uh, the urethra as well. And so here you can see highlighted the erectile tissue, which are the bulbs of the vestibule, and just posterior to the bulbs 
are uh, greater vestibular glands. So these are glands that are going to secrete mucus upon excitation, which is going to come into the vestibule of the vagina. And these uh, glands can become impacted. And um, so when you're palpating and looking for the bulbs of the vestibule today, uh, you, really palpation is the best way to feel them. So you have the labia minora and you're trying to figure out, you're afraid to cut and figure out where the bulbs are. You can kind of feel where it's just skin and then you can feel a, uh, a tougher swelling underneath the skin and that's where the bulbs are. And so when you're looking for that, uh, that make it easier and you can feel a little more confident that you can cut the, um, cut the other tissue and you're still going to have the bulbs. And here you can see the greater vestibular glands. I gave you a little bit more information about them and uh, the autonomic innervation will be reviewed with you when you do that. All right, the lesser vestibular glands are smaller glands uh, that are in the skin of the vestibule, the vagina, and they open up into the vestibule. And they kind of open up, they have a, a, a rate that is constant. And so, whereas the greater vestibular glands d increases tremendously during sexual excitation, the lesser vestibular glands sort of do regularly have their secretions come into the vestibule. They're not the same as the parourethral glands. These are, a are smaller, minute, there's multiple glands that are all in the vestibule between the urethra and the vaginal orifice. Okay, so there are different glands there. The periurethral gland, so I'm going to orient you to, this is the anterior, this is the oblique cut here. This is the anterior wall of the vagina. So let's say we're looking at the wall of the vagina, and here you have the female urethra. In between that, there are some glands that are called the periurethral glands, um, and they're also referred to as the Skeen's glands. And they're much larger than the periurethral glands and the male urethra that empty into, although the female does have smaller ones as well. And th this is supposed to be um, the female prostate gland and they actually have tested the secretions from this gland um, and it does have uh, the same consistency of the prostate gland. And it is involved in the female sexual response of female ejaculation as well as um, rhythmic contraction of the urethra and release of urination release of urine, okay? And so when they're, in the female, the periurethral glands are referred to as the skeins, and they have their own larger openings, one on each side of the or, of urethral orifice in the vestibule of the vagina. And sometimes, uh, depending on the swelling in the area and the cadaver that uh, you're dissecting, you can see these openings. I have seen many of them. So those are a lot easier to find in the bulbal urethral ones. Okay, so which of the following glands of the female perineum could impinge on the wall of the rectum if severely infected? So we just went over the glands and think about where they're located at. This is also from your clinical, uh, clinical blue boxes from the text. Which glands? Greater vestibular, I got a greater vestibular. How many of you agree with that? That is true, all right. The greater vestibular gland because it's much closer. Uh, to the uh, anus and the rectum. And so if it was uh, in impacted, they can get easily infected. And if it's really infected, then it, it can append upon the wall, or at least that's, that's what the text says. Okay, I believe it. You all did pretty good. Well, actually, no, you didn't do that well. All right, so if you're looking at the, the perineal muscles of the female, now that we've gone through the uh, general anatomy of it, they're gonna be very similarly named. So the bulbospongiosis muscle, although they don't meet in the midline, they are going to cover the bulb of the vestibule. And then you're going to have the ischiocavernosis muscles that are going to be over the cura of the clitoris. And then there is going to be the superficial transverse muscle that is going to meet in the midline where the perineal body is at the most posterior part of the perineal membrane. Okay? All right. Fascists. We, we learned some players and we know that they're there, but now we need to kind of tease them out from each other. Okay? So there are two different types of fascia in the perineum. There is superficial fascia. You, you are familiar with this. You don't think that you are, but you are because you dissected the abdomen and they're continuous with the layers of the abdomen. So there are some, there's superficial fascia in the perineal region and there's deep fascia. Deep fascia is different, a whole other beast. 
okay? So the superficial fascia in the perineal region is called Colley's fascia, and it is continuous with Scarpa's fascia on the abdominal wall. The deep fascia layers are different. They're not. So you can see the Colley's fascia has been cut away in this picture to show you other fascia layers deeper, and you can see deeper structures like the muscles of the perineum. All right. The, in females, the fatty layer, uh, the campers fascia from the abdomen, is going to be continuous with the mons pubis and the labia majora in the perineal region. But in males, the amount of fat in the perineum is really, really reduced. And so you're not going to see large amounts of fat in the perineal region. But these, the fat layers from the abdomen is going to extend and be continuous with the fat that you were wading through on Monday in the ischial anal fossa. The ischial anal fossa has an anterior recess that you may or may not have uh, discovered then, but you'll discover today if you have not. And so um, the ischial anal fossa is continuous with this layer in the abdomen as well. All right, now this is a picture that uh, Dr. Campo gave you already in uh, her, her lecture when she talked to you about continuity of the fascias, and I just have it on here, and you can test yourself uh, with, on the different layers by looking at the colors and go back and forth. So this is a mid-sagittal section, and you can see how uh, the membranous layer, or scarpus fascia, in the abdomen is going to be continuous with layers down in the perineum. They're, see, they're blue, but they're named different things. In the penis, that superficial fascia is called the superficial penile, penile fascia. In the scrotum, that superficial fascia layer is called the dartos tunic. And in the rest of the perineum, it's called Colley's fascia. We're all talking about the same layer, and it's continuous with each other. Okay? And then the deep fascia is going to be the red fascia, which we're going to get to here. So, the big summary concept I want you to hold on to is that Scarpa's fascia, Colley's fascia, superficial penile fascia, the penis, and Darto's fascia of the scrotum are all superficial fascia. They're all one continuous layer. They're just named by the region that they're in. All right? They're just named that way. Okay, so now we have deep fascia. And there's luckily only two. So, uh, but you will be able to find them. You will, I know, that I have faith that all of you will find the deep fascia of the perineum. Okay, and so uh, in this illustration is going to show you Kali's fascia. So when you're looking at illustrations, make sure you kind of pay attention to uh, what, what you're looking at because you see that the white fascial layer is covering everything. On this side, you see muscles. You see muscles, and so that is, uh, has been removed. And the perineal membrane is one of the deep fascias in the perineum that we talked about. It's going to attach to the ischial pubic rami, uh, anterior, the pubic symphysis, the ischial pubic rami, and in the back it attaches to the other side in the perineal body. All right, the other deep fascia is called Gallaudet's fascia. Gallaudets. There's only two. You're already familiar with the main player perineal membrane. The other one's called Gallaudets. That fascia is on top of, or it's called investing fascia, of those deep muscles we already went over. It's the white fascia layer that you're taking off to see the ischial cavernosis, the bulbospongiosis, and the superficial transverse perineal muscle. If you're Lucian muscle fibers, you just went through Gallaudets. Gallaudets is attached to the perineal membrane. That's why they're, they're a continuous layer. So Gallaudets, perineal membrane are the two deep fascias of the perineum. Okay. All right, and so uh, here I have just one last illustration here for you to uh, really hit a home run. And you can see how the Colley's fascia is cut open, and then you have remnants, of purple remnants of Gallaudets and between these muscles in this triangle, you can peek through and see the perineal membrane. You can peek through and see the perineal membrane. And it's connect to the bones deeper, but you can see it between those muscles, make this little triangle, and I urge everyone to do that. So that perineal membrane and gallaudets are gonna be connected. You'll have to cut them open to see the muscles underneath. All right, and one more deep breath. Another one more big concept here. There are two spaces in the perineum that you need to be concerned about conceptually. 
You're going to be looking at a lot of stuff when you're dissecting, and it's all going to just seem like it's slammed in together. But conceptually, I need you to think about the fact that the perineum has two spaces that are separated by your friends, the perineal membrane. That's why you really want to become intimate with this perineal membrane. You want to know where it is, OK? So here's the perineal membrane. This is my cartoon drawing here. I have the pelvic diaphragm. Let's just, let's just go, let's just go uh, as completely cartoonish as I could. The pelvic diaphragm, fascia underneath the pelvic diaphragm that's involved in these muscles. Doesn't have anything to do with these other things. Perineal membrane, that deep fascia, the perineum we just talked about. And then that colles fascia, that superficial fascia that was continuous with the anterior abdominal wall. Okay? If you go, if you're dissecting downwards from the skin and you open up colles fascia, which means you can see stuff in here, that's called the superficial perineal pouch. Okay? There's stuff in the superficial perineal pouch. We're just we're going to talk about the contents in a second. If you see that perineal membrane and you go beyond it, which you don't have to dissect the, the, neck, the deep pouch, but if you did, you would be in the deep perineal pouch. And there are contents in that pouch as well. You're not really going to see it when you're looking with the legs abducted and you're dissecting in there. But when you cut the pelvis in a mid-sagittal cut and you're looking at it sideways, you should be able to find the perineal membrane, that deep fascia. It's tough and it's not going anywhere and the stuff superior to it, so that's the superficial pouch, and the space between that and the pelvic floor is going to be the deep. So you will find it. It's just going to be more of a concept than it is a really big space. And these are potential spaces for things to accumulate. All right. So it's a potential space. You know where it's at. Between colleagues and the perineal membrane is the superficial pouch. And you're looking at all the contents. Luckily, you are very familiar with them because we just went over them. So there are some structures that are in males and females in the superficial pouch. For example, the superficial transverse perineal muscle was in both sexes. And you have branches of the internal pudendal vessels, which you were dissecting out on Monday. They, they moved, continued anterior inferiorly, and then they came superiorly to come into this perineal region. You're not, not there yet, but when you come to, through dissecting from the way you're going to today, you'll be seeing vessels and nerves, and those are the players that you started with on Monday. And so uh, they're not depicted in this image, but they, you can see them in the dissector. So the internal pudendal arteries and veins and the pudendal nerves are going to be in this pouch. And so are so is so are garlovet's fascia fascia layers okay but in the male you have a bu the bulb and cura of the penis right and then you have the associated muscles ischiocavernosus and bulbospongiosus that are also in this superficial perineal pouch and then you have the proximal or bulbous part of the spongy urethra which is inside so these are just thinking about the contents and what's in that location all familiar to you hopefully because we just went through them in the female, you're going to have those same structures we talked about that are the same between male and female, but you're going to have a, the clitoris instead of the penis. So you have its associated muscles, the ischiocavernosus that are over the crora, and you have the bulbs of the vestibule instead of the bulb of the penis, and you have the opening to the vagina opening of the urethra. Okay? Those other things are the same. Okay. And the greater vestibule, the glands as well. All right. In the, the deep perineal pouch, yes? Is there a spongiosum and cavernosum associated with the urethra or not? No. The female urethra doesn't go through a rectal tissue. Okay. Okay. So the, if you go beyond or, or uh, deep to the perineal membrane, you're in the deep pouch. You're not expected to dissect it, but you do need to know what's in the deep pouch, okay? So, um, and this is what it looks like. So you can see the proximal portion here of the urethra. In the male, it's going to have bulbar urethral glands, and it's going to have the dorsal nerve of the clitoris or the penis, depending on uh, which sex you're dissecting, and also the blood vessels alongside. In the deep pouch, you also have an anterior recess of the ischial anal fossa. So if you were in the ischial anal fossa and you shook your hand and tried to move it anteriorly, you'll be in this little pocket where there was fat up in there, too. So don't forget to, to do that uh, for your concept as well. 
Okay. So both sexes are going to have these things, the urethra, which has a external urethral sphincter muscle in both sex sexes, okay, and then the pads. Now, the males, the deep pouch of the males is going to have the intermediate part of the urethra. The female does not have sectioned off different parts of the urethra, and deep transverse perineal muscles. So the, it looks very similar to the superficial ones, and it does connect to the perineal body, but these are deeper in the deep pouch, okay. Then those bulbal urethral glands that we talked about are there, and also the neurovasculature that we discussed, the dorsal nerve, uh, dorsal nerve of the clitoris or the penis, and the internal um, arteries and veins, pedonal arteries and veins. All right, in the female, you have the proximal part of the urethra. You have a mass of smooth muscle in the place of the deep transverse perineal muscle. So it looks very similar, but it, it has it's smooth muscle instead of skeletal muscle, which means it's autonomically innervated. And I've looked at slides of this, and it kind of it's very interesting with all the, the different slips of muscle sort of interwoven together. And your textbook has a page and a half on this area in the female that's talking about how the new discoveries of anatomy and losing medical imaging has changed the concept of the female deep perineal pouch. So please uh, refer to that. It's very interesting. Okay. All right, a male fractured his pelvic girdle at the pubic symphysis, which caused a rupture of the intermediate part of the urethra. Where would urine and blood be likely to accumulate? I don't know, anybody. You're going to say B, the deep perineal pouch. That's correct. That's the most likely place that it is going to accumulate. Let me see if I have my check marks here. Yeah, but it can also come up through the hiatus, the urogenital hiatus, and be extra peritoneally around the prostate and bladder. But I have you thinking in the right direction of thinking about injuries and thinking about fascia continuity and where things would accumulate um, in that situation, okay? And there are other ones too, and this is from one of your uh, clinical boxes in your text. All right, and so this was just to remind me to talk about the change in the concept of these perineal pouches that used to be described, there used to be a UG diaphragm that was described anatomically as being in the deep perineal pouch area that was made up with different fascia layers, but they have uh, realized that that is not the case, and that's why they we're, we're teaching you the current um, anatomic notion on these pouches. But some, some clinicians that you may talk with may still use those terms, and so you, you need to be aware that it's out there and be aware of the differences. So I'm going to refer to that. And the last thing is that I'm not, we're not doing nerves until Friday, but I just, since you're already in the area and you're dissecting things, I have to talk about some discrepancies that you have with the materials because it's frustrating not only to you but to us sometimes. Your dissector mentions the pudendal nerve, and the pudendal nerve branches and has perineal branches that go into these perineal pouches and innervate the muscles and the skin of these perineal pouches. It doesn't give you uh, any differentiating terms to describe any of the branches, except for the dorsal nerve of the clitoris and the dorsal nerve of the penis, which is going to go in the deep pouch. Okay. It also, that nerve also has sprigs, other sprigs that do the deep musculature. But the dissector is very, it doesn't really discuss it, it kind of just goes right through it. But your text has kind of a little bit more detailed uh, description where it explains the pudendal nerve branching into a superficial perineal nerve that is going to terminate as posterior scrotal or labial for sensory and also has autonomic functions to the skin. And then there is a deep perineal nerve that they describe as going to, into the perineal pouches to innervate the muscles and uh, do some skin sensation for the female around the vestibule of the vagina and the urethral area. Okay. And then they talk about the dorsal nerve of the penis and the clitoris. But what we need you to remember is all about the pudendal nerve. The pudendal nerve has multiple branches, many of which is unnamed. But these are the three that they discuss in the textbook, but there are also other branches. All of the muscles and all of the skin in the perineal region is done by the pudendal nerve. Okay? And then Dr. Compo will pick that up later and give you a lot more detail about autonomics as well. 
Thank you so much. I'll see you in lab. Let me know if you have any questions.